Dr. Cornelia Wilson is the guest speaker for today's conference. Dr. Cornelia Wilson uh, is a senior lecturer and academic laboratory director at School of Human and Life Sciences, Canterbury Curious Church, University of United Kingdom. She is also associated with the University of Liverpool Institute of Translational Medicine, Department of Molecular and Clinical Cancer Medicine, United Kingdom, and Novel Global Community Educational Foundation, Australia. We are highly thankful uh, to her for recording her lecture. Kindly play. Hello, my name is Dr. Cornelia Wilson, um, and I'm going to be presenting to you today a presentation um, on the work that we've been looking at in lung cancer. And the title of my talk is Investigating the Impact of MicroRNAs on Sortal Lung Deregulation in Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer Carcinoma. So lung cancer is an aggressive cancer uh, with poor prognosis irrespective of sex, whether or not you're male or female. Now in France, um, there are around 25,000 people um, who are dying from lung cancer and in the UK, it's slightly higher at 35,000 people uh, per year. And this equates to 1.59 million deaths worldwide. Now there are several different types of lung cancer uh, the main form is non-small cell lung cancer, which is the most common form. Whilst we also have small cell lung cancer, um, around 15 to 20 percent of cases, this is often uh, more common in men and is fast growing and starts in the bronchotubes and metastasize to the brain, liver and bone. And there's also both types, which are mixed cell and large cell cancer. Now, it's more common, lung cancer is more common in the aging populations so over 65 years of age, um, but there has been an increase in incidence in the female population between the age group of 35 to 44 uh, in the last five years. Um, and these are based on figures from France. And in the UK, um, it's been prevalent in the last 10 years. So there's been an increase in incidence in the female population. Um, not surprising the causes and some of the main causes are obviously smoking 85 percent whilst there are a number of cases um, where people do develop lung cancer who have never actually smoked and they've actually potentially been exposed to secondhand smoke or or we call this passive smoking at 15 percent cases and there are also cases where people are exposed um, in their jobs so there's an occupational environment exposure particularly to car fumes and so air pollution um, so particles um, in the air atmosphere can potentially um, irritate or cause inflammation in the lung and potentially could be um, a source of um, um, lung cancer and also maybe there are genetic history uh, within the family So we've been interested in studying exosomes. Um, I don't know if people know about exosomes. Exosomes essentially is um, um, the smallest of the vesicles. So these are known as the extracellular vesicles. And um, you might have heard of extracellular vesicles or even exosomes. So exosomes are essentially a small membrane um, vesicles ranging in size of about 50 to 100 nanometers in size. And they're formed um, by uh, through the um, the endosome, um, the endosomes which are um, called the multivesicular bodies, um, they form by invagination of the plasma membrane. So invagination of this plasma membrane of the uh, the multivesicular body, which results in the vesicles will contain cytosol, um, and also they will contain uh, proteins um, and nucleic acids, particularly messenger RNA and microRNAs. Um, and so they form inside these multiple cyclic bodies. Now, there are kind of two pathways in which um, exosomes can be, uh, can follow. So uh, one pathway is that the, the uh, multiple cyclic body fuses with the lysosome and the content is then degraded and um, obviously um, some of these molecules, um, macromolecules, will be then recycled. The other pathway is actually the exosomes or extracellular vesicles get released uh, from the cell and they're released into, um, into this extracellular space um, as um, exosomes. And exosomes, I'd say, they can vary in size, but normally they're the smallest of the, of the vesicles. 
Um, there are other types, so actually I'll talk about those in a moment, but the exosomes can actually get taken up uh, by a target cell. So it must, it might be a cell which is quite, quite close by, or it could be a cell which is um, further away. And so they could actually enter the um, blood circulation and then move throughout the body. Um, there are actually a form of communication um, uh, in the body. So the exosomes can be taken up and then um, are kind of trafficked uh, through the normal uh, pathways. Um, but exosomes potentially could also, some of the content in the exosomes could be, um, could fuse with the membrane and be taken up uh, in, into, into the recipient cells. Now, uh, I don't know if you can see because my picture is probably overlooking this, but there are also other types of vesicles. So these are kind of plasma, plasma membrane derived vesicles. So these are kind of outward uh, budding of the plasma membrane. These are often much um, larger and it's an un kind of unregulated um, process. Now, exosomes can be involved. So when we study them in cancer, they've been shown to be involved in a number of processes, including angiogenesis, through so angiophilic cell activation, uh, invasion metastasis, um, immune system evasion, and also proliferation. And we can also see them um, in, uh, in uh, if we isolate them from a blood sample, we can actually see them with a special type of um, nanoscope, which is used in something called a nanocyte, uh, and see that these little dots here are actually individual exosomes, which are kind of floating in solution. And we can measure actually the size um, and also the, the population as well. So and then this is because of uh, bromium motion. And we're using called dynamic light scattering. Sortilin is a neurotrophin receptor, is a member of the vacuole protein sorting 10, VPS10 family of receptors, which consists of around six receptors. The function of sortilin is that it, it is a co-receptor for um, trafficking proteins through the cell from the trans network to the plasma membrane and to the endosome and also to the lysosome for protein degradation. Now, my lab actually showed that sortilin could modulate exosome biogenesis. So exosome biogenesis essentially is the formation of exosomes in the multivesicular body. And it played a role in the biogenesis and also the release. And one thing that we discovered was that sortilin can form a novel complex known as the test complex with two tyrosine kinases known as track B and EGFR, known as the epidermal growth factor receptor, which we call now test complex. And this suggested that sortilin modulates exosome biogenesis and release. Now sortilin, um, the human sortilin is encoded on the gene um, for the chromosome 1P13.3 and it produces 13 variants, the transcription of which is um, driven by separate uh, promoters. So sortilin sort 1A is the full length form, which includes um, the, um, the, the full length of the messenger RNA, which then translates into um, the protein, which would have the signal sequence, a propeptide, and a long extracellular domain with a transmembrane domain on the cytoplasmic tail. It's a type 1 membrane protein. Whilst um, sortilin 1B is a shorter version um, and is not expressed as a protein and is only found as a messenger RNA. We were interested to study the expression of sortilin in non-small cell lung cancer and we compared um, tumour tissue with um, normal tissue uh, from 81 uh, samples and what we found was that the um, uh, sortilin 1A 
there was uh, a reduction in the levels of the expression of sortolin 1a. We saw also the same case with sortolin 1b, which was also significantly um, reduced in, um, in the um, tumour tissue. We also um, looked at sortolin 1b and what we found was that it, it was not detectable in non-small cell lung cancer. Um, but whilst it is actually expressed in uveal melanoma, breast cancer and also embryonic lung. Next, I wanted to perform a profiling study of patient samples. So we, we isolated exosomes from 120 plasma samples and we performed both a microRNA profiling um, of 2,100 microRNAs using the HTG molecular platform and then did a validation through RT-PCR. We also performed a protein marker analysis to check to see whether or not we had exosome markers, so such as CD63, TSG101 and flotillin as well as target proteins such as EGFR and sortolin and track B. I will focus really on the microRNA profiling. And we accessed a platform from HTG Molecular Diagnostics. And we prepared the samples and the samples were sent um, to for library preparation. So here we um, the there is a, a preparation of the samples. around 20 hours and then afterwards the barcodes added to to the um, to the samples uh, which takes about two hours and then a quantification step and normalization the next generation sequencing and then data analysis now the samples we're looking at um, we had four groups we had our control group of 30 patients we had a COPD, which is a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which includes people who have emphysema and bronchitis. We had a low stage group um, of 30 patients, um, and we also had a high stage group of 30 patients. Within these groups, we also had squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. We performed um, some clinical um, analysis just to see whether or not we had um, a good balance of male and female, and also we checked um, things like um, um, how many cigarettes um, people had smoked, um, and we classified the clinical stage according to the clinical data available. We now performed a, a microRNA profiling, and from the microRNA profiling, we identified many candidates. We identified candidates which were upregulated and ones that were downregulated. There was a big list of um, different microRNAs that could potentially be interesting candidates. We then um, selected 30 candidates uh, for validation of A80 samples of early stage lung cancer versus matched healthy versus COPD. So we performed a study where we actually compared from the same set of samples that we had um, uh, control versus cases. So we're looking at people with low stage <clears throat> uh, lung cancer and people with high stage lung cancer. Um, we identified <clears throat> different microRNAs that were affected in low stage and high stage. So we've been interested in studying um, sort of expression um, and the effect on um, migration. So this is work from a PhD student from my lab, uh, Mina al Yazbaki. She's been um, looking at sort of an expression. And um, this was actually a study where we just looked at um, different cell line expression levels of uh, sortolin. Um, we're comparing different lung cancer cell lines, particularly non-small cell lung cancer. So remember in the first couple of slides, we showed um, how sortolin is actually the expression is changing in um, different lung cancer cell lines and what we see is that uh, these SK mess cells have very low levels so this is the messenger RNA level uh, whereas we can see um, with the Kalu 1 cells and H358 they have much, have much higher levels um, of sortolin. 
Now we've actually focused on the SK mess cells um, and we actually generated um, cell models. Um, so what we find is actually when we look at uh, wild type cells, so the parental cells, SK mess cells, we don't have any detectable level of sort of protein expression. The scrambled is an empty vector uh, cell line where we've transferred it with an empty vector. And here, P sort is where we've actually overexpressed sortlin and made a stable cell line where we've overexpressed sortlin. Um, so, this is just to show the loading control um, by Western blot. Now, we performed a migration assay. So, this essentially is um, uh, a wound assay. So, what we do is we scratch off um, um, a a surface, so um, in the monolayer using um, a pet tip. And what we do then is measure the invasion, so the migration across this uh, this gap over 24 hours. And what we find with the wild type cells is that they complete the gap. Uh, and also uh, with the um, empty vector, they also complete the, um, the, um, the wound. Uh, whilst with the uh, overexpression of sortlin, we actually slow down the invasion uh, capacity um, of um, SK mast cells. So this shows that um, migration is affected by overexpression of sortlin. We also then wanted to look at um, some work uh, from a student of mine, um, Jess Holder. She was a master's student, um, so we've been looking at um, microRNAs, and we identified potentially microRNAs that may be controlling sort of expression, and and so we generated um, a microRNA mimic. Um, so essentially, this is um, something that will mimic the microRNA. So we transfect this microRNA mimic into the cells, and it will, this will then act as a microRNA whilst um, a microRNA inhibitor will actually bind to the microRNA and block the action of the microRNA. Now, microRNAs are particularly interesting because they help to control the expression of um, several genes. And so from our study, we were able to identify particularly interesting microRNAs that may be controlling the expression of sortolin. And what we did here was we control, um, did a resazarin assay to so see whether or not there was an effect on the proliferation rate uh, when we used our microRNA mimic or the inhibitor. And when we, when we use either of those, we actually see a reduction in the proliferation of our cells. We also performed a similar assay, so the uh, wound assay, where we can see also is that when we uh, transfect the mimic and the inhibitor, we can actually reduce the invasion, so the migration um, of the cells. So these are the SKMS cells within 24 hours compared to the control mimic and the control inhibitor. Next, we looked at the effects of the microRNA inhibitor and mimic um, on different genes that may play a role in sortolin expression. We concentrated on MAP9 um, kinase, APP, amyloid precursor protein, which is often implicated in Alzheimer's disease, BCL2, which is um, a pro-apotopic gene, E2F1, and presenilin. What we found was that with the, um, with the, um, the mimic, um, we saw that there was only a significant um, decrease in with the mimic um, of APP. Whilst with the inhibitor, what we observed that there was a significant decrease in MAP9K with the inhibitor, an increase in APP, an increase in BCL2, also a, um, a slight increase in E2F1, and also an increase in presenilin 1. Now, we wanted to see whether or not by using the microRNA mimic or the inhibitor, was there an, um, an effect on the expression of sortolin? And so we performed this experiment and we incubated uh, with the different, with the microRNA mimic and the microRNA inhibitor. And what we find is that um, when we use the inhibitor, we can restore the expression 
acetylcholine, indicating that the microRNA inhibitor was actually um, um, helping to uh, recover acetylcholine expression by inhibiting um, a particular microRNA. In summary to my talk today, um, we've discovered that SORT1 gene produces two variants, the transcription of which is driven by two separate promoters. The expression of both SORT1A and SORT1B is significantly reduced in lung cancer compared to normal adjacent tissue. MicroRNA profiling vaccines identified many candidates for validation screening, and we have identified a microRNA controlling the expression of SORTLIN in lung cancer. So it remains me to say thank you for, for listening to me and also all the organisations and funding bodies who um, supported our cause um, and this work. And also um, I'm really indebted to uh, Professor uh, John Field, Mike Davis, uh, Dr. Uh, Lacus Lilliglow and also Amelia Asher Segredo of the Liverpool Lung Project. And thank you again. Uh, I want to uh, invite Dr. Adnan, who is director of IM Group of Researchers and always being a great sport for us, for his conclusive remarks. Assalamu alaikum, dear valued guests, participants, and at same team. Is the fourth international conference on life and chemical sciences with the theme from lab to life emerging trends in biological and chemical sciences come to an end i want to express my sincere gratitude and pride for the success of this event on behalf of the organizing committee i want to thank our guest speakers participants and especially the dedicated team that worked hard to make this conference happen our goal focused on providing valuable education and raising awareness through research has come to life through the lively discussion and knowledge sharing during these enlightening days. Organized by the IM group of researchers, this conference provided a common ground for the students, researchers, scientists, and professors in life sciences and chemical sciences to share insights, experiences, and the latest advancement in their fields. The objective we set for this conference were not just met, but surpassed thanks to active involvement of everyone present. We successfully encouraged collaboration between experts in biological sciences and chemistry, opening doors to innovative solutions for global challenges, discussions on healthcare, drug discovery, sustainable practices, and the exploration of chemistry of nature and biomolecular sciences have undoubtedly advanced scientific understanding, paving the way for future breakthroughs. I want to express my appreciation for the commitment shown by participants in promoting ethical chemical research, environmental awareness, and safety measure. This conference has not only been a platform for an intellectual exchange, but also a catalyst for building a community of responsible researchers dedicated to making positive impact on society. Uh, special thanks to our distinguished guest speakers whose expertise enriched the conference and to every participant who actively contributed to this, the, to the discussion. My gratitude also goes to the organizing team whose careful planning and ensure the smooth flow of events. Uh, I'm confident that the knowledge shared and connection made during this conference will go beyond these walls and make a lasting impact on the laboratories, classrooms, and research institutions represented here. As we part ways, Let's carry forward the spirit of collaboration, innovation, and ethical responsibility that defined the fourth international conference on life in chemical sciences. Uh, thank you all for your unwavering support, and I look forward to future endeavors.
activists that continue to push the boundaries of scientific exploration and social impact. Thank you all.